Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. Uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing and encouragement and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with his word, and more in love with people. You'll be able to find our text this morning in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, you'd also do well this morning to find Genesis 3. Should be easy to find. And um, just put a bookmark there. We'll be in Genesis 3, 4, and 5. But our text this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11. If you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 1, it says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. But God, testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God has translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for an opportunity to be in your house this morning. God, your word promises that through your spirit, you would help us to understand truth. So we claim that promise this morning. We ask that through your spirit, you would help us to understand your words. Give us the courage to apply it directly to our lives. And we pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So two weeks ago, we started our series on faith, which we, you may remember we aptly entitled Faith. Um, and in it, we spent the first part looking at the meaning of faith, right? And we said a lot of things concerning the meaning of faith. You may remember in the beginning, we had lots of Lots of Greek and Hebrew words, right? And we really try to exhaustively word study and, and search this thing out um, to really figure out the idea behind faith. And so we said a lot of things, but one of my favorites was that biblical faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. Then we moved on to look at the reward of our faith. And you might remember that the reward, as seen in Hebrews 11 verse 2, was that we could be accepted or, we, uh, or, or are approved by God. And we wrapped up our time two weeks ago by going outside of the text in Hebrews and finishing in the book of Matthew by looking at an example of faith. And so this morning, I just want to talk to you about the power of faith. The power of faith. And so listen, before we get mistaken, before we get sidetracked, before your mind gets sidetracked, please know this, right? The power of faith is in the message of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Right, The hope that God has given from the beginning of time, or another way that we could put it is this, faith in anything other than Jesus Christ is powerless. Right, It has no power. This power, though, the power of faith, is twofold. It's twofold, and we see it this morning. It's shown to us in the most meaningful way possible, right? By showing how the power takes effect in the lives of believers. And so the two believers who experience the power of faith were Abel and Enoch. Abel and Enoch. And so first we see through Abel that faith has the power to be counted righteous. 
Faith has the power to be counted righteous. Listen, no greater gift could a person be given than to be counted, right? There's no greater privilege than to be counted um, righteous by God. To be counted righteous by God is the great need of man, for we are not righteous, right? Ecclesiastes 7.20, for there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Right? Then we get to Romans. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There's nobody that is righteous. You might know people that you would consider to be good people, people you would consider to do good things, people who, who are kind, people who do charitable things. But the reality is, as the prophet Isaiah stated, when held into the proper comparison, when held to the proper standard, their righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. Right? So the need to be counted as righteous before God is the greatest need of man because without it, we shall not be allowed to live with God. But praise be to God, the story of Abel tells us that there is a way to be counted righteous. So how? How is it that we can be counted righteous? In fact, you know what? This, let's just make this a little more personal. I, like, I understand why we say we. Right? We say, we have all sinned. I get it, right? I want to include myself in there. I don't want to sound like I'm harping on your sin or I'm accusing you to be guilty of something that I am not guilty of. Please know, I know I'm a sinner, right? Skinner used to have this thing. He said, Skinners are sinners too. It was his little slogan. If you remember, if you were from, from here then, you would remember. He said it almost every time. I'm trying to come up with my own, right? I'm early in the game. I've been working through Owens be no ones, we sinners too. But listen, <laughs> we're working on it. We're going to figure it out. I'm not, not sold on that yet. Please know, I, I understand that I'm a sinner, but I want to make this a little bit more personal because sometimes when we change the pronouns back and forth, right, when we say we, right, it somehow it, it might allow us to escape, to think that somehow this doesn't fit me. We say, oh, that's, that's for my neighbor next to me, right? That's it's my wife. My wife's a sinner, you know what I'm saying? But that doesn't apply to me, right? I want to make this personal, right? Not in an offensive way, just to be offensive to offend, right? But I want to make it personal. I want to bring it home. All right, so let's switch it up. How is it possible for you? How is it possible for you, a sinner, whose sin, the Bible tells us, literally puts us at enmity with God, at war with God? How is it possible for you, someone whose greatest deeds, whose best works are but filthy rags when held to the proper standard. How is it possible that someone who has a wicked and deceitful heart above all else could stand, counted righteous before an almighty God? How is that possible? You had better know the answer this morning before you walk out of these doors. Abel shows us in Hebrews 11 verse 4, it says this, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. So listen, Hebrews 11, at least in part, is in the context of Hebrews 10.38. Not rocket science there, right? Hebrews 10.38. Now the just shall live by faith. So by the time we get across the page to Hebrews chapter 11, right, the author is giving us examples of the just living by faith. And the very first person, according to the biblical record, to live by faith, right, and thus be counted as just, was Abel. See, Adam and Eve, they, they walked by sight, right? They walked with God. They talked with God face to face in the garden before sin entered in, right? But now, after the fall, we walk by faith. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And so the example that Abel shows us is that it's by approaching and worshiping God exactly like he says, Right, but to really understand this example from the word, we got to do some background, right? We got to get some context. So that's where we're going to go back to Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, they became aware of their nakedness, right? Their nakedness seems a picture of being aware of the uh, uh, and conscious of their sin. It says this in Genesis 3 9. And the Lord called unto Adam and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. 
Listen, God loved them. And he provides a covering for their nakedness. Do you remember what that covering was? What? Coat of skins. It was animals, right? God loved them. He provided this coat of skins from animals. It was a symbol that sin was to be covered by the shedding of blood. A symbol that pointed to the blood of Jesus Christ. A symbol that said, listen, uh, uh, blood must be shed in order to cover the sins of man. Note, before we move on, let's, let's get the whole thing. Genesis 3, 6. It says this, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice of the Lord uh, God walking through the garden in the cool of day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called out to Adam, and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard that voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so we see from the very first parents that walked the earth, God laid it down, right? The, the sin and guilt of man must be born either by man himself or by a substitute, right? Man could not cover the fact or the guilt of his sin any way that he chooses. Right, man had to die for sins or else there has to be a substitute for that sacrificed for his sins. Adam and Eve passed this down then to their children, Cain and Abel, and then look what happened, right? Look in Genesis 4, right? So Genesis 3, we got the root of sin. Genesis 4, the spread of sin. It says this in Genesis 4, 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also bought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall not thou be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And he said unto thee, And unto thee um, it shall be his desire, and thou wilt rule over him. And Cain talked to Abel his brother. And it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he slew him. So then we get to Hebrews 11.4. It says, by faith, that's pistis, if you remember um, last or, or two weeks ago, that, that Greek word for faith. So by faith, by pistis, by this firm persuasion, the firm persuasion of what? It's the firm persuasion that what God passed down to his parents then what God passed down to Adam and Eve, how God told them their sins could be covered, right, by the firm persuasion that that was the truth, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And it says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So the difference between the two offerings is this. Abel believed God, and then he approached and worshipped him exactly how God said, through the sacrifice of another. Listen, but Cain didn't believe God. He did not accept God's word. Thus, he did not approach God through the sacrifice of another. He made a material sacrifice to God. He made an offering to God. Right? He approached God through earthly gifts, through the works of his own hands, through the fruit borne by these frail and feeble and dying hands. Or to put it more simple, Abel believed God. He recognized that the only way that he, a fallen, sin-corrupted, wicked-hearted human, could possibly stand as righteous and acceptable before God was through the sacrifice of another. Right? He believes God and he trusted what his word tells him. And so I asked this morning, man, what about you? What, what about you? 
Right, because 1 Peter 3.18, it says this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, for the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God, being uh, put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. This is the power of faith. Right, faith gives us the power to be counted righteous. Look back, Genesis 15.6, And he, Abraham, uh, believed the Lord, and he, God, counted it unto him for righteousness. Acts 13, 39. By him, uh, him being Jesus, all that believe are justified from all things, for which he could not be justified from the law of Moses. Romans 3, 24. Um, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul speaks to the Galatians, Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ um, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Then he writes to the Philippians, and being found in him, not having my own righteousness, but uh, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So note, real quick, we beat this horse dead. We're not going to beat it dead much longer. Note, back in Genesis, Cain approached God. He was religious. He did attempt to approach God through works. He approached God through this personal sacrifice of works. It was this religion of man. That's to say it was his own choosing Right, His own ideas, his own imaginations of who God was and how he could approach God. It was his own thoughts. Abel approached God the way that God wanted, the way that God prescribed, while Cain tried to approach God the way that he wanted. Listen, God doesn't make this hard, thus he gave us his word so that we can understand because God wants a relationship with you. God wants to walk with you. God wants to be near to you, right? Listen, don't get a mistake in Matthew um, 11. In verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants you to come unto him. He says, Take my yoke upon you, like two oxen plowing through the valleys of life together. He said, You can learn of me, for I am meek and lonely at heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. He doesn't say it's hard. The next verse, he says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God wants to be near. Psalm 45, 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that call unto him and to all that call upon him in truth. And so we see from the story of Abel, it, it shows that the, the proper or the, the power of faith to be counted as righteous um, when by faith we approach God and worship God exactly like he says. But the fig leaves from Genesis show us that we can't stand before God of our own making. We don't get to choose, right? And what an indictment on so many different religions, right? What an indictment and what a challenge for us that we should be searching our hearts to make sure that we are worshiping and, uh, uh, God through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, and through nothing else, right? Jesus once had an interaction with a woman from Samaria in John 4, who instead of dealing with the issue of her sin, right, she wants to discuss the difference between different religions, between the Jewish and the Samaritan religions, to the which Jesus replies in John 4, 21, Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour is come when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth truth. Listen, she didn't know who to worship. She didn't know where to worship. She didn't even know how to worship. But Jesus made it clear that not all religions are equally acceptable before God. And he goes on to say, some worshipers act in ignorance and unbelief. You can't worship my God any way that you want. 
That's not to say that we all worship him the same, but rather only those who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right, obey the truth, can worship God acceptably in both spirit and truth, Jesus said. John even, it suggested he takes it a step further, and he actually suggests that ones who come, one who, ones who try to come before Jesus any way that they please, that these deeds are actually evil. I mean, isn't that what he's saying in 1 John 3, 11? Right? And when he starts on 11, he says, we need to want, love one another. In my verse 12, he says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one who slew his brother. And wherefore did he slew him? Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Jesus summarizes this whole idea for us, right? And he breaks it down for those of us who may be a little more intellectually challenged like myself. And praise God, right? John 14, 6, he says, I am the way. You can't worship my God. You can't come before my God. You can't stand before a righteous and holy God any way that you want. Jesus said, I am the way. You must worship him in spirit and truth. Praise God. He said, I am the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus, in his effect, says you can't come to God. You'll not be able to stand before God. You'll not be able to stand before him, counted as righteous, accepted, and acceptable before him any way that you please. But when you hear his word, when you trust his word, when you obey his word, no matter the circumstance, no matter the consequence, we then have the power to be counted as righteous. And his Holy Spirit then will dwell inside of you and it will guide you in truth. And thus it enables us to worship in truth. Through the Spirit, John 16, 13. How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you in all truth. But listen, if you have yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have the Spirit. And this may sound very harsh, but if you don't have the Spirit, your acts of worship are nothing more than superstition. Right? It says this in Acts 17, 22. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, and he said to the men of Athens, I perceive ye in all things that, that ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, that takes us back to Hebrews eleven three, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And he hath made one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before they appointed and hath bound uh, the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might find or they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of our own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of him as God had like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Hebrews 11, 4, but by faith, Abel, through faith, he was able to offer an excellent sacrifice, a more excellent than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Right? Abel, through faith, he produced a right sacrifice, which gave him a right standing, and it provides for us this repeating sermon through the generations. So faith has the power to be counted righteous. And praise God. Faith also has the power, remember it was twofold, faith also has the power to give a person a daily walk with God and deliver you from death. 
right? And we see this glorious gift. It's illustrated through Enoch, right? So if you turn to Genesis 5, right? Genesis 5, 21, we get the account of Enoch. It's a short, brief account, but Genesis 5, 21 says that Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, and he begat Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. I suspect maybe Methuselah had reached his teenage years, and he said, oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I got to be walking with God. <laughs> uh, we don't really know the circumstance, but he had a kid and decided in that moment, I better not try to raise this kid on my own. And thus he started walking with God. And said, and all the... Uh, and God begot Methuselah 300 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So back to our passage, the writer of Hebrews 11, verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Listen, Enoch believed God. And he believed that if I walk with God, if I walk with God, I fellowship with God day by day, all day, that God's going to look after him. God's going to take care of him. And therefore, Enoch did walk with God because he believed God. And God did look after him. And God did take care of him. And you know what? In fact, God even conquered death for Enoch. Right, he did exactly what every one of us who profess to be Christians are called to do. Walk with God. Walk with God. Colossians 2, 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. I love the way that Oliver Green, he kind of sums up the story of Enoch. He says this, it's been said that Enoch was walking with God one day and they walked and talked in such sweet fellowship that near nightfall, God said to Enoch, it's nearer to my house than to yours. So let us go to my house. Right? And what a wonderful way to think about it. Right? But the Bible simply tells us that Enoch walked with God and that he was not, for God took him, right? When Enoch was ready to go, when, when Enoch was ready to go home to God, God transferred him right into heaven, right before his, presence, his own presence, right? Enoch experienced firsthand then the promise that every single believer is promised. And that's the promise from the very word of God that says we shall never, ever taste or experience death. Praise God. Praise God. I was looking on the internet. Don't ask me why I ended up here. But there's a company, Alcor, A-L-C-O-R, and for $200,000, they'll take your body and preserve it cryogenically with the hopes that the technology will advance to be able to bring you back to life. I don't know if they know, but I got a guy for that. Right? Jesus literally brings the dead back to life. It's through faith, not $200,000. But if you want to sow that seed to this ministry, we can... No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I was just playing. This is not prosperity gospel. Listen, it's by faith in Jesus Christ, our spirit, right, is dead. It will be regenerated when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. When we come before God the way that God prescribes, we will literally be brought back to life. John 3, 14, right? Jesus told this to Nicodemus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall be frozen cryogenically, no, but, but have eternal life, right? Faith in Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross for your sins enables you to be delivered from the eternal consequence of your sin, which is death. The second death, actually, if you want to be specific, which the Bible describes as an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that ye might know thee the only true God and, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The author of our text, Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels from the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by he, the grace of God, we should taste death for every man. Right? Enoch believed God, and he walked with God, and his obedience was pleasing to God. Thus God delivered him from death. Look at the record that we find of Enoch back in Genesis 5. Right? It's brief, but he lives in a very unique time. Right, look back with me, Genesis 5, beginning in verse 5. It says, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Verse 8, and all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And all the days of Enoch, verse 11, Enos, verse 11, were 905 years, and he died. Verse 14, and all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 20, and all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. Verse 23, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Verse 27, and all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. Verse 31, and all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. It would seem that Enoch is living in one of the darkest periods of history, right? He lives in the midst of dying men, right? In the midst of people who are dying and presumably spending an eternity in hell, yet he did not die. He was translated, right? That word is derived from two Latin words, which literally means carried across. God took him to heaven alive. In that short story of Enoch, we see that, listen, there is a future state of existence for both body and soul. But we also see from the story of Enoch that those who please God in this world shall dwell with God in the world to come. But Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So what was it in Enoch that pleased God? His faith. It was his faith. He believed God. But his belief in God then led to action. It didn't just stop at belief. Your belief must go from here to here and produce something real. It must produce some sort of action. Not that those works get you to heaven, but rather those works are evidence that that faith has made it from your brain just as belief then to actual faith. He believed God, and it led to action, this confident obedience to God's word in spite of the circumstances and consequences. Regardless of what everyone else around Enoch was doing, he chose to walk with the Lord. It was faith that resulted in faithfulness, not pleasing unto men, but God which trieth the hearts, as Paul said. And so I just want to challenge you this morning as we're really wrapping up. Inquire into the nature and reality of your faith. Right? I think a lot of the times when we, when we do these self-evaluations, we're tempted just to focus mainly on the works. So the pastor stands up and says, inquire into the nature and reality of your faith. And we say, well, I have faith. I come. Right? I, I have faith. I'm, I'm, I'm here, aren't I? I have faith. I, I've taught a Sunday school class. I have faith. I, I'm on the green team, right? And we describe our faith then, and it, and it doesn't get any further than works. Right? But it, it, prayerfully through this morning, we've seen the necessity to dig deeper than the outside, right? And to really inquire into the actual nature of our faith and the reality of our faith. If our faith is not sound and scriptural, nothing else can be right before God. 
right? Because we cannot become, come before the Lord any way that we please. You can't worship my God any way that you want. But faith has the power to be counted righteous and to give us a daily walk with God, then delivering us from death when we worship him as he prescribed. So listen, if you don't have faith here this morning, can I just give you a simple rundown of the gospel? God sent his son, right, his only son as a sacrifice on your behalf. He was born of a virgin. That way, his identity wouldn't be mistaken. We would know exactly who it was. He lived a sinless life, and that made him the only worthy sacrifice. He would die on the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He conquered death and hell, and he rose from the grave on the third day, right? Faith in that has the power to deliver you from death, right? Which is the wage of your sin, for the wages of sin is death. The second death, the wages of your sin is an eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell, but you don't have to go. Faith has the power to deliver you from death. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and you shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And it's not hard. Listen, the Bible says all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you can be saved. Would you do that this morning? Would you do that? Would you stand with me this morning? As we get ready to enter into this time of invitation, listen, if if you've never placed your faith in the Lord, if if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, right, and trusted in him, actually placed your faith in the sacrifice of his son for the forgiveness of your sins, you can do that this morning right where you're sitting, right? You don't have to to pray some special or fancy prayer. Your prayer of salvation this morning could literally be, God, come into my life and save me from my sins, But if you don't know, if you say, you know what, I've I've never prayed before. Pastor, would you please, could somebody just help me call upon the Lord? If that's you this morning, man, you come forward. There's somebody here, I I myself, I'll get down, I have my my Bible, I would love to show you. Pastor Herb would love to show you how you can know that you can know that you can have a home in heaven. Love to help you call upon the name of the Lord this morning so that you can be forgiven of your sins. I'm going to pray, and when I'm done praying, the altar will be open. If you need to come before the Lord, inquire into the nature and reality of your faith, man, I pray that you would do that. If you got a need, you need to come and ask God, petition God for some healing or for some sort of intervention in your life, this is the time, right? This is, you can come before the altar. It's not a place of embarrassment. It's a place of acknowledgement, acknowledging that I am needy before a powerful, powerful God. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to have been in your word this morning. God, I pray that you would work and move through this invitation in a way that only you can. God, I pray that if there's someone here that doesn't know you and they're on the fence, God, that you would push them off the fence in this moment and that they would run to you. They would call out upon you for the forgiveness of sins. God, work and move through this invitation in in a way that only you can. We pray this in your name. Amen.